So you've got another judge for me. Yes, sir, I do. Fantastic. And will there be any children murdered by their own fathers with God's implicit approval in this one? No. Amazing. So tell me about this next judge of yours. He's the biggest, baddest, most felonious judge ever. Felonious? Murder, arson, and he's a con artist too. This? Are you still talking about the new judge? Oh yeah, he's a Nazarite and you know how badass they are. Do I? Of course you do, sir. They can't drink wine or eat grapes at all. Okay. And they aren't allowed to cut their hair. So yeah, there's that. You're really not pulling me in with this Nazarite stuff. It's just so badass. Saying it over and over again doesn't make it come true. You realize that. It doesn't? So let's back up a bit, shall we? What's our new hero's name again? It's Samson. There were three judges immediately preceding him that we haven't talked about, but they were all total nobodies. Even Elon? That sounds like the name of a famous person. What are you looking at? Elon. Elon was the least of those three. He gets a grand total of two lines. He was a judge and then he died. Huh. So tell me about this Samson. Sure thing. So yet again, the Israelites did, did evil, evil in, in the, the eyes, eyes of the Lord. Lord. So the Lord delivered them into, into the, the hands, hands of the Philistines for 40 years. years. And Samson is going to be the vehicle through which God confronts these Philistines. Tell me again why God needs a human to confront a bunch of ignorant Bronze Age barbarians again? Well, technically they're Iron Age. Oh yeah, Yahweh had a problem with iron-fitted chariots, didn't he? Yeah, but he's leveled up past that. Well, great. So, where was I? The Philistines need confronting. Oh yes, that's right. So what's Samson's first move? He decides to marry some random unnamed Philistine girl. And what's the story there? It isn't clear, but God appears to be mind controlling Samson to pick a wife outside the Israelite people. Oh really? No free will for Samson, huh? Yeah, this way there's sure to be conflict in the usual Rube Goldberg-esque way that God likes to do things. Rube Goldberg? Never mind. So on his way to visit this barely mentioned plot device, Samson gets attacked by a lion. Uh-oh, isn't it going to be hard for Samson to survive a lion attack? Actually, it's going to be super easy, barely an inconvenience. Oh, really? Yep, the Spirit of God comes over Samson and he kills the lion effortlessly. Well, great. And then Samson finally gets to the plot device and he decides that, yeah, sure, he'll marry her. God's plan, working to perfection so far. Sure is. And after some time, his past, Samson revisits the carcass of the lion he killed and it's full of bees and honey. What the hell? What's going on there? I have no idea. Is this Larry? Larry. Gotcha. So Samson scoops up some of the carrion honey and eats it. Blah. And that bizarre episode forms the basis for a riddle that results in the deaths of 30 men. What on earth? See, Samson is at his wedding feast among the Philistines sometime later, and he just announces this arbitrary deal. Let me tell you a riddle. If you can give me the answer within seven days of the feast, I will give you 30 linen garments and 30 sets of clothes. If you can't tell me the answer, you must give me 30 linen garments and 30 sets of clothes. And they just go along with this? They do! Well, okay then. <laughs> and then Samson delivers this epic riddle. Out of the eater, something to eat. Out of the strong, something sweet. Sounds less like a riddle and more like four vaguely related phrases strung together randomly. Well, whatever the heck it is, the guests at the feast definitely can't solve it. So after four days, they threaten to murder Samson's wife's family. Wow, that escalated quickly. Why don't they just tell Samson to take his crappy, unsolvable non-riddle and shove it where the sun don't shine? Unknown. Huh. So Samson's wife begs Samson to give her the solution so that her fellow Philistines don't murder her. I can certainly understand her motivation in the context of the story. What I can't understand is how any human society could ever develop into what you're describing here. It's because that's what I wrote. Oh, okay, that makes sense now. Damn straight. So Samson does finally explain the riddle and his wife immediately relays this to her people, who then in turn immediately relay it back to Samson. Well, I guess this was the quickest way to diffuse this increasingly volatile situation. Oh, it doesn't diffuse anything. No. Nope. Samson is pissed because he knew his riddle was unsolvable unless his wife spilled the beans. Ah, I see. Thus proving conclusively that Samson is a con artist trying to scam valuables from the guests at the wedding party.
Bingo! So, Samson must be embarrassed having been caught out trying to swindle all those people. Oh, hell no. He's angry, and he heads straight to the Philistine town of Ashkelon to forcibly collect 30 people's clothes to uphold his end of the deal. How does he manage to take all those people's stuff? Don't they resist? He murders them. Oh my god. Yeah, that makes taking their clothes a lot easier. How is Samson able to kill that many people? With God's help, you big silly. Oh, that's nice. So Samson heads back to drop off the clothes to fulfill his obligation, and then he returns to his father's house, still burning with anger. So, Samson has just committed a very public mass murder. Yes? Well, there must be repercussions. There appear to be none whatsoever. Why not? Because that works. So Samson just carries on, and the families of these 30 murdered innocents are never heard from at all. Well, great. But hopefully he learned his lesson. How do you mean? If he's ever going to mature into a wise leader for the Israelite people, he's going to have to start acting like a rational adult. Yeah, that's not Samson. Oh, it's not? Well, to be fair, it would help if Samson was surrounded by other rational adults. Oh, goodness, what are you getting at? When Samson goes to visit his new wife after the mass murder, he finds out that his new father-in-law gave her away to one of his groomsmen. <laughs> what? For reasons that are never explained. His wife's dad didn't think think he liked her. Wouldn't it make more sense if the reason that Samson's father-in-law gave his bride away was because Samson has revealed himself to be a mass murdering con man? Oh, yeah, that would make more sense. Then I'd have to rewrite several lines of my work. Oh, I wouldn't want to put you out. Let's just leave that dumb, stupid reason in there instead. Great. So Samson has lost his bet and lost his wife. Does he reflect on his life choices up to this point? Nope, he's a man of action. Oh, so what's his next move? He does the only thing a man whose wife has been given to another man could do. Ah, go to her and try to win her back. Oh, I didn't think of that. No, he simply catches 300 foxes, ties their tails together in pairs, and attaches a torch to each pair of tails, and then lets them loose in the Philistines' fields. Oh, well, yes, obviously there's that too, of course. So Samson's not only an arsonist, he's one heck of a fox catcher too. He sure is. And now that he's burned down a ton of the Philistines' fields, they want revenge. So they go after Samson. Actually, their first move is to burn Samson's wife and her father to death. What? What did they do to deserve that besides being associated with that batshit crazy Samson? I guess that was enough. So Samson goes postal on the Philistines and kills a bunch more before running off to a cave in Judah. Okay. And the Philistines and the help of the people of Judah to get Samson extradited back to Philistia. All right, but as soon as Samson gets near the Philistines, the spirit of the Lord comes over him and he kills a thousand of them with a donkey jaw. Really? Yep, and I came up with this epic line. Are you ready for this? Sock it to me. Samson says, with a donkey's jawbone, I have made donkeys of them. Wow. Burn. So with the death toll well over a thousand, I imagine the entire Philistine army turns out. Oh, nope, they just leave him alone. Obviously, he's unbeatable. Huh, I think that might be the first sensible thing you've written. Thank you. So what happens next? Samson goes to see a prostitute in the Philistine town of Gaza. He's a whoremonger too. Yep, and the locals lie in wait to try and kill him. Oh no. But he avoids a confrontation by leaving the whorehouse in the middle of the night. I thought God wanted him to confront. Hey, shut up, and Samson pulls the city gate out of the ground, and then he leaves it on top of some hill. Why? I don't know. That's good enough for me. And then Samson falls in love with delight. Oh, it's a love story now. Oh no, 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 no. There's no backstory to this at all. You're not going to add even a single sentence to justify this relationship? Nah. Delilah's just there to be approached by the local Philistines who bribe her to betray Samson. Fine. So she tells them no and warns Samson. Actually, she has no qualms whatsoever with betraying the man who loves her. Oh. Well, maybe you could take a moment to establish that she's a deceitful, evil little wench. You could have a lot of fun fleshing her out as the signature antagonist of this story. Uh, I mean, here is your chance to exercise a little creativity. A man, a woman, ulterior motives. Nah, that would take a lot of work. So you're just going to stick with your dumb, lazy way of writing characters? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, okay then. Now, the Philistines want Delilah to find out what's the secret to Samson's great strength so that they can subdue him. Right. So rather than doing anything clever, Delilah simply blurts out, what is the secret to your great strength and how can 
you be subdued? Wow, that really is some lazy writing. Boy, it is, isn't it? Well, it doesn't matter because I've written Samson having some fun with the situation. Having fun with the situation? Wouldn't such a question from his wife instantly raise a giant red flag? Yeah, it should, but I've got Samson acting incredibly stupid here. Oh, okay, so what's he gonna do? He lies to Delilah and describes falsely how he could be subdued. What is the point of that? It'll piss off Delilah. And what is the purpose of that? Ah, jeez, you and my creative writing profs have such a hard-on about character motivation and plot structure and stuff. Sorry. Can I just write the story the way I want? Please, carry on. So Samson tells Delilah that if she ties him up with seven fresh bowstrings, he'll become as weak as any man. All right. So the Philistines give her these bowstring thingies and hide nearby, and then Samson simply allows her to tie him up. Okie dokie. And then Delilah shouts, Samson, the Philistines are upon you, but he frees himself easily. So now that Delilah has revealed her treachery, Samson divorces her? Oh no, he's going to go through this charade two more times. What? Delilah demands to know the secret to subduing him. He's going to describe a couple more different wrong ways to go about it. And then the exact same end scene is going to play out. That makes so much sense. And when none of that works, Delilah is going to simply nag him incessantly about the secret to his strength until he gets sick to death of it. And the light bulb finally comes on and Samson flees from this treacherous woman who is clearly trying to bring him to harm. I don't know what this light bulb is of which you speak, but no, Samson finally reveals to Delilah that the secret to his strength lies in his uncut hair. Oh, he does the most idiotic thing any human being could possibly do in this situation. Yes. <laughs> well, okay then. So Delilah cuts off his hair while he sleeps. The Philistines capture him easily and they gouge out his eyes and throw him in prison. God doesn't help his champion this time? Nope, he leaves Samson because, you know, his hair is gone. God is so good, always. So the Philistines make sure they keep this extremely dangerous man in his weakened state by regularly shaving his hair off. No, there's nothing in here about that. Oh, whoops, whoopsie. So Samson's hair grows back. Yeah, how'd you know? It uh, tends to do that. I should make a note of that. Are you telling me you didn't know? And the Philistines are partying in this big temple full of thousands of people. And they bring Samson out to put him on display. Oh boy. And Samson stands between two pillars. And with a final shout of, let me die with the Philistines. He pushes the pillars apart and the temple collapses, killing everyone. Oh, wow, 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 wow. And that concludes the story of Samson. So what do you think? That was something. Thank you. I have several more ideas like these for some more judges. Oh geez. My next one is going to be the story of Rumpelstiltskin. He weaves straw into gold in exchange for a princess's firstborn child. Uh... And then we'll go back to another female judge and the hair motif with Rapunzel. I think maybe you should- And I'm super excited about Paul Bunyan and Babe the Blue Ox. This Bunyan guy is a giant and he'll kick some Philistine butt like you've never seen. This probably is the wrong- I've even got this sailor named Popeye who has Samson-like strength, but instead of getting it from his hair, he gets it from a can of spinach. Stop. Look, left-handed assassins and badass Bible babes nailing men's heads to the ground are all well and good, but this really needs to be the only outright fairy tale we put in this book. Aw, oh, man, seriously? Seriously, it was a ton of fun. Poorly written fun, I'm not gonna lie, but so bad it's good nonetheless. Shoot, maybe you're right. I am. Well, if I can't write some fun, playful stuff, I'll just write some not-so-playful stuff.